Good evening. I'm going to wait just about a minute uh, so others can join in. Uh, usually, I don't do uh, live discussions outside of uh, my field, which is 9 11 and the areas relating to it, but I feel that this situation uh, deserves a rational discourse, which is what we are not getting uh, from the media itself. In fact, um, the amount of propaganda that I'm seeing from the legacy media is unprecedented. I, I can't believe the disinformation and misinformation campaign uh, that is happening right now. Uh, it's astonishing, really. And so I decided to do a, a, a video regarding uh, a comprehensive history regarding the Central Intelligence Agency and their involvement in the Ukraine uh, and in, in Ukraine uh, that goes back decades. Now, you, you, you're going to have to find, uh, I tried to put as many uh, informative uh, links and information in the description box uh, for you to uh, view at your own leisure. Uh, because I like to at least give some information to the public uh, regarding um, the situation at hand, which could get out of control because it seems that we're not getting any rational voices to the table regarding any peace talks anytime soon. Uh, it seems that the United States, the only thing they know is war and sanctions. The sanctions is a, um, a precipitation. It's an act. Of, it's a declaration of war. That's what oil sanctions are. That's what food sanctions are, economic sanctions are. Because they they go to hurt uh, the public, not the uh, the rich or the oligarchs or the affluent. So in this video, I want to try and, and give you a, a comprehensive history regarding the Central Intelligence Agency and these old programs that began during the Cold War back in the early 1950s and how the CIA continued to have a a, an influence in Ukrainian politics all the way to the current day and may give you a little bit of a sense of what is going on and why it's going on. This is not a, also, this is not um, a pro-Russian point of view. If I need to tell you about the criminal nature of the Russian government under just Vladimir Putin, well, then you are going to be quite uh, enamored with the history regarding the corruption and the amount of murder that Putin has conducted to his dissidents and to the corporate press and to the, the press inside Russia. I don't know how many journalists have been killed uh, that have given a favorable, a disfavorable review of Putin and the government over the last uh, eight to 10 years, I can only imagine how many people, I mean, it's, this is not secret. It is not nothing that uh, shouldn't be known to you. But much like a scene in the film Road to Perdition, where Paul Newman is talking with Tom Hanks, both of them are involved with the organized crime, where Paul Newman basically tells him, Michael, take a look around in this room. There's nothing but murderers in this room. That is the Ukraine-Russian crisis in a nutshell. And I'm going to try and give you a comprehensive history of the Central Intelligence Agency, U.S. interests, foreign and domestic, regarding this conflict, which leads to the current moment. So, and plus, you're not going to get any really true unbiased perspective regarding this conflict, unfortunately. If you're not inside the United States, you most likely won't have a, a polarized problem like we do in the States because everything in the United States is uh, polarized to human constructs such as politics, religion, and racism. Not to say it doesn't happen everywhere else, but it's more so here than anything. And plus, we also have uh, agencies like you know the Defense Intelligence Agency, the CIA, basically use the media um, in prop with propaganda. Uh, and that's it's working in this case. So how did I come to this uh, instance regarding the Central Intelligence Agency? And I, I did a recent uh, podcast, which has yet to come up. I did it yesterday with my co-host Richard Cox for the Darkened Hour. 
where we talked about the the uh, the war in in Ukraine, and that the CIA actually did play a role in training the uh, separatists in the disputed regions of Donetsk and Lushank um, in their fight with the Russian military. What I what I found out as of late is that the CIA has had a, um, a vested interest regarding the Ukraine and Russia that goes back to the Cold War. And there's an article by, and plus I got, I'm going to tell you right now, I have about, I don't know how many articles I have up, maybe close to 15. I'm not going to read them all, but uh, you know, it just gives me a better perspective in a timeline. Uh, this is actually from the Philadelphia Inquirer, and it's dated December 11, 2010, where it says, Declassified CIA files detail ties between U.S. and ex-Nazis. And the article goes on to say that declassified CIA files reveal that U.S. intelligence officials went to great lengths to protect a Ukrainian fascist leader and suspected Nazi collaborator from prosecution after World War II and set him up in a New York office to wage covert war against the United States for the CIA, according to a new report uh, by Congress. And that's 2010. The individual, um, is, is his name is Mikola Lebed, and he led an underground movement to undermine the Kremlin and conduct guerrilla operations for the Central Intelligence Agency, which is the OSS, during the, uh, in World War II, and for the CIA during the Cold War according to the report, which is public now because it's a classified. Um, two scholars under the supervision of the National Archives uh, created a freedom of information request regarding these uh, classified documents. Now, according to the report, in which I put in description, uh, which is, um, I want to say it's the, um, uh, I forgot the name of the article already, my mind is shot. But it's in the, it's in the description box, and it's in, it's in a report form. It's four hundred pages. Go read it. It is astounding. You'll see. The report says that Labed helped a Ukrainian nationalist organization that collaborated with the Nazis in the destruction of the Jews of the Western Ukraine, in which he killed tens of thousands of Poles. Now the report details post-war efforts by U.S. intelligence officials to throw the federal government's Nazi hunters off Lebed's trails and to ignore or obscure his past. Now, Norman J. J. W. Gorta of the University of Florida, who wrote the report with Richard Brightman of American University, he was quoted as saying, you can make the argument that the CIA should never have gone near this guy because of his past. But I would argue that that's exactly what the CIA wants they want somebody with a nefarious past. They want somebody who has dirty hands because he could do the work for them other than getting a CIA operative to do the work itself. So he can do the work on behalf of the CIA. Now, of course, this guy conducted war crime atrocities, and it basically came at the behest of uh, Jewish citizens in uh, Poland. Now, I, I, I remember the report name. It's called Hitler's Shadows. Nazi war criminals, U.S. intelligence, and the Cold War, linked in the bottom of the description. That report draws from an unprecedented trove of records that the CIA was persuaded to, to declassify. And it was over a million files from the uh, Department of the Army. Now. Among other things, the authors of this report say that the files show that U.S. intelligence officials used and protected ex-Nazis during the Cold War. Now, we all know about Operation Paperclip, which was to get Nazi scientists and intelligence officials to come to the United States and share all their reports and program and intelligence and their data with U.S. intelligence officials and the State Department. And in return, they would have their records slight, uh, swiped clean and they wouldn't face prosecution at the Nuremberg trials. 
This here is a hidden history in which hardly anyone talks about. Now, the report also shows that no intelligence, U.S. intelligence agency anyway, aided Adolf Eichmann's escape from Europe after the war. But uh, the CIA, after they agreed to release the over 1 million pages, uh, basically even had like a disclaimer in which I'll read a quote from uh, George Little, who's a CIA spokesman for the media. He basically said, the CIA at no time had a policy or program to protect Nazi war criminals or to help them escape justice for their actions during the war. <laughs> I mean, does anyone believe that? No, of course not. And history goes on to say that that's not the case anyway. That's not all. The report also illuminates something else. The U.S. government helped to relocate this mass murder of Jews and this Ukrainian nationalist who is an, a, an, a big, huge assistant to the CIA regarding covert operations in the Ukraine, relocate to New York City, which is where I live, where he was safe from assassination, actually, because they wanted to kill him. And the CIA wasn't done with them. They basically funded an organization called Prologue, where he used that company to gather intelligence on the Soviets from the late 1960s to 1991. 31 years. Labed uh, eventually passed away in 1998. But It just goes to show you that this program that he was involved was a program that the CIA used. Now, the pro what am I talking about? This program that Labed came from. Well, it was called Project Aerodynamic. Uh, for those who don't know, Project Aerodynamic is basically um, an intelligence operation that involved Labed and other Ukrainian activists to spy on uh, and collect intelligence on Soviets inside the United States and abroad. Now, the purpose of Project Aerodynamic was to exploit anti-Soviet Ukrainian resistant groups in Western Europe for intelligence purposes. So he had an entire network in Eastern Europe working on this project, which was basically a CIA operation. Now, in the now, I'm gonna I'm gonna read some parts of the document because this is really important because it's a multi-pronged operation. Now, the purpose of Project Aerodynamic, according to the to the document, which is made available in the description, is to provide for the exploitation and expansion of the anti-Soviet Ukrainian resistance movements in the Cold War. Such groups like the Ukrainian Supreme Council of Liberation. Uh, the Ukrainian insurgent army and the foreign representation of the Ukrainian Supreme Council of Liberation. And these were groups in Western Europe and even in the United States. Now, also according to the document, Area, Project Aerodynamic is a joint foreign intelligence project that involved the Central Intelligence Agency and it was approved on November 3rd, 1952 for the operating period ending June of 1953. But that project expanded, actually. The project had been successful in dispatching agents into the Ukrainian military and established contact with two of the dispatched in the military and in government. Now, according to the latest information revealed from the headquarters of the resistance movement, which is one of the groups the CIA uh, was involved in this operation, they uh, had gained access to intelligence reports regarding uh, negotiation with foreign powers involving the Ukraine and coordination of activities in support of homeland resistance when it comes to uh, Russian influence in the country. 
The objectives of this operation was training of agents to strengthen the existing uh, links to further the foreign intelligence mission in the Ukrainian military and to solidify the assets in the underground. So not only did these guys basically, the CIA, basically have operations with these nefarious murderers like Lebed and these organizations that were killing Jews in Poland, but also with dissidents in the military, Russian dissidents who were in the Ukrainian military. And also they were to obtain operational and positive intelligence on targets in the target area. So in other words, they were trying to conduct guerrilla operations, covert guerrilla operations on Russian interests in the Ukraine. And this is amazing when you think about it, because you're not, if you're not like me, if you're like me, you, you had no idea this was going on. Now, if I'm, I'm going to assume a lot of people who are watching this, who are basically more well known about what is going on than me. I, I'm like trying to catch up here and trying to report without any bias mindset here. And I think that's, I'm hoping that's a success. But learning about this history that goes back decades, unfortunately, we're not going to know about this through the media. Whether it's from Fox and Newsmax or ANN to CNN, MSNBC, ABC, NBC, who are promoting full war. And the third, um, the third objective was to establish a sound working with the intelligence service of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists and the principal underground party subordinate to the uh, HUVR within the Ukraine and to provide access to the positive intelligence and information provided by the CE. The CIA also provided training, briefing, and dispatching of agents here in the States and in Eastern Europe, the maintenance of communications with said agents dispatched within the United States and within the Ukrainian resistance movement in Ukraine and Eastern Europe, the establishment of a cadre program which will provide a continuing source of highly qualified recruits. So that means they will keep recruiting people. It could be Russian dissidents who want to work with the CIA in the Ukraine in providing intelligence. We saw this in World War II, for example. Establishment of also a face agent training from Germany to domestic operations branch. And I'm going to show you why that's important, because the countries that are involved with this operation are countries in the NATO program. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Uh, and also, finally, to bring out of the Ukraine documents and certain key resistance personnel to eliminate any Russian involvement in the country. So what I'm trying to show here by reading off this document is that the U.S. had interests in Ukraine 74 years ago. And I'm not making this up. I'm trying to provide pertinent documentation for you so that you can see for yourself what the media is not telling you. Now, like I said, one of the primary contacts for the CIA was Mikola Lebed. And he's a, again, he's a, a Ukrainian fascist leader and he's suspected of also being a Nazi collaborator because he actually, I have to bring this up because in, in 1934, he went on to murder a Polish interior minister, Borislaw Pierski. Um, now, Pierski basically, uh, who took part in the Polish-Ukrainian War in 1918-1919, 
uh, was a Polish military officer and politician uh, and took part in many heroic activities. Well, he was killed in 1934 by Lebed, and the court sentenced him to death, but the state commuted the sentence to life imprisonment. So what happened? Germany invades Poland in 1939, and, what, and guess what? German intelligence actually recruited Lebed and got him out of prison. And he basically was working with the Nazi regime in locating Jews in Poland, which led to the tens of thousands of deaths. Now, why am I bringing this up? How is this relevant? Well, because what we're seeing from the left media is basically this collaboration that they're trying to fight a anti-Semitic, racist, uh, authoritarian in Putin. By the way, yes, he is to some of those things. However, they themselves are supporting a government which was shaped on all those principles and conducted mass atrocities on Jews in Poland with the help of the intelligence services and these resistance groups, which later were funded by the CIA. And which is a link because that's exactly what we're seeing currently. Okay, so that's what that's what Labed did. Um, so why is the United States basically having such a vested interest with the Ukraine? Uh, according to the book authored by former White House uh, security advisor Zygmunt Brzezinski in the Grand Chessboard, he basically warned the United States under the Carter administration, later the Reagan administration, where he basically says, in order for the United States to have to be the sole superpower, they must have the Soviet Union not to challenge it by taking over Eurasia. And so for decades, the United States held a vested interest in Eastern Europe, which is basically the conduit between Asia, Europe, and Russia, and why the NATO formed, and why this is actually pertinent to what is going on today. And I'll try to make sense of everything. Now, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention how the United States meddled into the politics of the Ukraine um, and also uh, how U.S. interests from what the oil industry, uh, which is the fossil fuel industry, the military industrial complex, um, the religious institutions which is something I won't get into because that's a huge discussion. And I would suggest everybody to uh, look out for Patrick McFarland of Liberty Weekly, where he's doing a podcast based upon the power of the Ukrainian church and the Catholic and the Russian Orthodox church and how much massive influence they have in the region that goes back centuries. I, I won't ruin it, but I saw the, um, the details in which he shared with me which was utterly fascinating. It would take about two hours to explain, and I can't do that. Um, but let's go to uh, former Senator, U.S. Senator, late Senator John McCain, and the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, Victor Newland. Uh, now, during 2008 to 2014, right before 2014, uh, no, I'm sorry, during 2014, because they attended the protests, which I'm going to talk about in a bit. Uh, why is this important? Why is this important? Why is John McCain siding with these right-wing uh, militia groups in which he did in Syria, where he's posed with these ghoulish jihadists in Syria? Uh, and this is no... no um, no shock because the CIA supported who? The ultra orthodox groups who were supposed to be at war with in the war on terror to try and overthrow the Assad government. 
Timber Sycamore is named a program that the CIA poured in millions of dollars with the help of Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Israel, in trying to uh, support these ghoulish uh, monsters like Al Nusra Front to give them arms and training to help overthrow the Assad government. So it's no surprise that McCain goes to these right-wing militia groups. And also, I would be remiss to also mention that throughout history, the CIA has a has a consistent history of using ultra-nationalist, ultra-orthodox sects to usurp left-wing governments. We saw this in El Salvador. We saw this in Nicaragua. We saw this in Syria. We saw this in Iraq. We saw it, now we're seeing it in Ukraine. Um, now, who's Victoria Newland? Well, she's married to none other than the co-author of the Project for New American Century, Robert Kagan. And they have a vested interest. Why? Well, let me play an audio for you, which was basically a speech back in um, 2014 at the National Press Club in which Victoria Newland was giving a speech here, which was sponsored by none other than Chevron Oil. Listen to what she has to say. Since Ukraine's independence in 1991, the United States has supported Ukrainians as they build democratic skills and institutions, as they promote civic participation and good governance, all of which are preconditions for Ukraine to achieve its European aspirations. We've invested over $5 billion to assist Ukraine in these and other goals that will ensure a secure and prosperous and democratic Ukraine. Now, five, $5 billion, that's not small change either. Where did that money come from? It's not coming out of her pockets. That's because she has vested interest with who? Probably the fossil fuel industry, which is the reason why they they uh, um, financially supported the the, the 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 lecture anyway at the National Press Club. Are they alone? Who knows? The CIA, um, foreign interests. Could be all of those things, but we'll never know where the money trail leads until it's public. But there you go. You have $5 billion worth of money coming out of the United States into the Ukraine, into Ukraine. And in 2015, the International Renaissance Foundation, who, by the way, and I hate to give any more conspiracy to this because one of the uh, board members is George Soros, gave out its annual report that has spent $180 million in Ukraine since 1990. Michael McFall, a U.S. ambassador to Russia, wrote an op-ed piece in the Washington Post in 2004 where he asked, did Americans meddle in the internal affairs of Ukraine? In which he said plainly, yes. Now, I could share that article with you, but it's behind a paywall. However, I found a copy, which I'm going to share with you, which I, I would have put in the description box, but I'll put it here in the comments section for you to read. And of course, when you have powerful institutions inside the United States, non-governmental organizations, these are not government organizations, these are non-government organizations, and you have a vested interest from the CIA in the Ukraine, now we could talk about NATO. the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now, NATO has expanded quite dramatically since 1997 all throughout Eastern Europe. And they include the following countries. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Slovenia, Croatia, 
Montenegro, Albania, North Macedonia, and Bulgaria. All bordering on the Russian affiliated states of Belarus, Ukraine, Crimea, and of course, Russia. Now, if you're the, the Russian government, you can notice when the um, the enemy is surrounding your your wagon, and if you take a look at the um, the geography of Eastern Europe, and you see these NATO countries, they're basically surrounding Russia. The only country now, Ukraine is not part of NATO, and to read about, the, to, to let you, uh, to inform you a little bit about this, uh, their relationship with NATO has been politically divisive, which leads to what I'm going to talk about next, the protests that led to the current crisis that we see today. Um, it's, a, it's in large part due because of the larger debate between Ukrainians' political and cultural ties to both the European Union and Russia. Now, NATO, uh, in, in 2008, under Ukrainian President Viktor Yushchenko, uh, Ukraine sent an official letter of application for the Membership Action Plan, which is the first step in joining NATO. But the leaders of Ukrainian government guaranteed their opposition in the country that membership in any military alliance um, would not pass without public approval in a referendum. So in other words, before joining NATO, they wanted to get the public feedback. Now, the idea did gain support from a number of other NATO leaders, particularly in the countries I mentioned to you. But the Russian leaders, like Prime Minister and President-elect Dmitry Medvedev, he made clear in 2007 that the opposition to Ukraine membership and leading up to the Bucharest summit, which involved Putin, actively lobbied against the Ukrainian uh, map. Now, according to uh, an Associate Press article dated May 31st, uh, 2008. Vladimir Putin, who was a, at that time, he stepped down from being the Russian president. We trade places with um, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, in which Putin basically was, was quoted as saying, Georgia's ascension into NATO will be seen as an attempt to trigger a war in the Caucasus. Because now they're overstepping their bounds. They're going into Russian territory, Russian influence. Because Russia is seeing NATO, which is U.S.-backed, and the coalition countries. They're seeing it as an affront to war. This is a huge problem that led to uh, a number of issues. Now, the Ukraine applied to begin a NATO membership in 2008, but it was shelled during the uh, talks in 2010 in which presidential-elect, uh, the election during the uh, Ukrainian elections, uh, was found to be disputed. But before that, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. It's important. Six years prior, in 2004, uh, there was a series of protests that took place in the Ukraine from November of 2004 to January of 2005, January, February, um, which was in, in the immediate aftermath of the, of the election in which um, – they claim the people were, and especially from the opposition, that there was massive corruption. 
There was voter intimidation from right-wing groups and electoral fraud in the capital of Kiev. These protests took place, which is going to be a consistent finding up until what is going on now. Uh, it was called the Orange Revolution. Now, the protests were prompted by reports that several domestic and foreign election monitors, as, as well as widespread public perception, that the results of the runoff vote between the two candidates, Viktor Yushchenko and Viktor Yanukovych, were rigged by the authorities in favor of the latter. And that's coming from a Time Magazine article, November 28, 2004, entitled The Orange Revolution. Six years later, which is the election I'm talking about, before I talk about this, Yanukovych became Yushchenko's successor as the president of Ukraine after the Central Election Commission and international observers declared that the presidential election was conducted fairly. This would be the only election in which it was deemed fair. Now, I know the people in this room know that uh, <laughs> the elections in this country are not fair. I mean, I, I'll, I'll admit that much. And it doesn't. It didn't start with Trump. This goes back decades. I mean, I don't vote. I think it's an insult to the American people to vote because. Voting only precipitates the problem to be a repetitive issue. But you get the default position. Oh, what are we going to do? We, we, you know, we can't do anything to change it. Well, yeah, you can. You just don't want to because it requires uh, sacrifice. Not talking about your lives, but real sacrifice that we have to make the real change necessary to live in a better world. And so. With the 2004 election marred by corruption and election scandal, in which Yanukovych lost, in the only fair election for Ukraine in the past 20 years, Yanukovych was elected president. Now, the reason why the U.S. has an interest in this election is because Yanukovych is an ally to Russia. Some even suggested that even before 2014, that the U.S. intelligence agencies, mainly the CIA, helped facilitate the corruption that led to the rigged election in 2004. So what happened? On November 21st, 2013, there was a number of protests sparked by the Ukrainian government's decision to suspend the signing of the European Union-Ukrainian Association Agreement. This was the precipitating factor to what we see today. Now, of course, there are other factors at play, which is the reason why I gave you a little bit of history involving nefarious uh, operations that want to get rid of Russian and Soviet influence out of the European unions, in which the scope of the protest came from the residents of Ukraine. Now, the Ukrainian government under Yanukovych chose closer ties to the Eurasian Economic Union, which is basically an economic union of the post-Soviet states located in Eastern Europe. It's in, that involves who? Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Russia. So Russian entities, instead of going with NATO. Starting to make a little bit of sense right now, what is happening in the current 
time frame. Now, there wasn't widespread violence in these protests. They were more, mostly peaceful. And you could see the protests on YouTube. Just type in Euro Maiden protests. Um, even though there, there were clashes throughout the Ukraine, uh, which was accompanied by barricaded, uh, where there were barricaded protests and some civil disobedience. But the real violence started three months later, which is in the, this protest was entitled the Revolution of Dignity, which started on February 18th uh, and lasted five days, February 18th of 2014. This took place at the end of the Euromaid protests, and this involved a series of violent events involving not just the city's residents, but the riot police and foreign entities that mixed in with the protesters. Now, remember that foreign entities and people from other states were involved in these protests. This protest forced Viktor Yanukovych out of the country. So in other words, this was a coup of the Yanukovych presidency and the government. The protests basically became so violent, it, it resulted in the death of over 130 people, including 20 police officers. And on February 21st, just three days later, an agreement between Yanukovych and the leaders of the parliamentary opposition was signed that called for an early election and the formation of an interim unity government. So in other words, Yanukovych was basically going to even succeed, uh, succeed his position in order and with the opposition and form a unity government. But Yanukovych, due to uh, death threats and the, and the violent protests, he fled the country. Well, he fled from Kiev. I'm sorry, now the country, but. Because the protest took control of the Capitol building. Now, if they were willing to work out a deal where they would have a unity government, why is it that they resorted to violence, which they were going to win anyway, in regards to having a unity government involving the opposition? I'm going to tell you why. When he left the, the capital, they then, the parliament meeting, declared unanimously that Yanukovych was relieved of duty in a resounding 328 to 0 vote out of the 450 members of government. So in other words, this was a coup. But who is it by? That's the question. In 2017, the then director of the CIA, John Brennan, visited, the Uk visited Ukraine and met with the Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsenyuk. Now, you'll have to forgive me. My New York accent gets in the way of announcing names uh, with authority because my vowels are pronounced. So you'll have to forgive me. <laughs> um, now, according to a Daily Beast article entitled, uh, here's what the CIA director was really doing in Kiev. He basically, Brennan met with the Prime Minister Yatsenek and First Deputy Prime Minister Vitaly Yarina, in which they discussed 
the formation of a new, more secure channel for sharing U.S. intelligence with the country, fighting against pro-Russian secessionists in its eastern cities. Now you can see why I'm talking about the CIA during the Cold War and why it has connections to now. Now, is anybody here now understanding why I'm giving this timeline of the CIA and U.S. interests to the current uh, point in time in, Uk in Ukraine and why it's so important to mention the real history of what's going on here and why the United States is involved? And this is basically the Daily Beast. The Daily Beast actually um, reported uh, from an interview with General Mark Breedlove, who's a retired uh, four-star general and commander of the United States European Command, where the Beast basically uh, said that they pushed to share more satellite imagery and other forms of data about Russian troops in the disputed territories of Lushank and Donetsk. But that was rebuffed by the White House. And Breedlove uh, served under the Obama administration. And he talked about the disputed territories at the time, Lushank and Donetsk. And according to senior intelligence officials who told the Daily Beast, those places have been run by the Russians for years. They are very good at collecting any form of communications intelligence, and they probably look to grow their network there. Why is this important? Because according to a Yahoo article, written by Zach Dorfman, a national security correspondent for the White House. The CIA trained Ukrainian paramilitaries, not just in Ukraine, but here inside the United States. I'll read you some of the article. This was dated January 13th, 2022, before the invasion. The CIA is overseeing a secret intensive training program in the United States for elite Ukrainian special operation forces and other intelligence personnel, according to five former intelligence national security officials familiar with the program. The program started in 2015 and is based at an undisclosed facility in the southern United States. The program is run by paramilitaries working for the CIA's ground branch, which is called the Ground Department in Langley. Uh, and it was established under the Obama administration. But it expanded under the Trump administration and it was given millions of dollars. And under the Biden administration, it was further augmented. By, and this is this come by the way, this comes at the heels of the protests and the revolutions that I mentioned previously. Because this is involving the disputed territories. And it's so important because what they're doing is trying to gain more control of the territories away from Russia. And by 2015, just Weeks after the protests, the CIA's ground branch, the paramilitaries within this group, traveled to the front in eastern Ukraine to advise their counterparts there. Who are their counterparts? Well, according to uh, uh, the Jacobin magazine, those were the neo-Nazi groups like the Azov Battalion. Now, you're wondering, well, who's the Azov Battalion? 
the Azov Battalion are a right-wing extremist neo-Nazi group. And they're a unit of the National Guard of the Ukraine. They make up about 5,000 people. They're based in Mariupol, which is basically a region in southern eastern Ukraine, north of the sea. Uh, and they were formed as a volunteer militia during the height of the protests in 2014. But they were incorporated into the National Guard during the uh, uh, the Revolution of Dignity protests. Understanding what I'm getting to? These were the people that were conducting the atrocities on the police that killed 20 policemen, that ramped up the violence. These are the people that the CIA is funding. I'm not making this up. I'm not uh, speculating here. I'm trying to share as much pertinent data as I can with you. Because what we're getting back from the media is not the truth. Now, this program, which is classified, by the way, it's not declassified yet. The CIA included training in firearms, camouflage techniques, land navigation, intelligence, and other areas. Now, of course, CIA officials denied that the CIA training program is or ever was offensively oriented. <laughs> offensively oriented. Right? Oh, it's out of our hands what the, these separatists basically conduct these uh, killings of Ukrainian police because we're trying to force a government that is wanting to be a part of NATO and U.S. interests are involved. The, pro the program itself is basically involved with specific training skills that would enhance the Ukrainians' ability to push back against the Russians. By the way, we're seeing that. Because the Russians really haven't pushed so far as of yet. They're, they're, you know, the Ukrainians can fight. they got a good military. So one of the people who spoke on anonymity, uh, who's familiar with the program, put it more bluntly, where he basically said the United States is training an insurgency on uh, aiding, on uh, implementing a program to the Ukrainians on how to kill Russians. <laughs> and of course, there's other factors involved. And, you know, I, there's so much web of deceit and nefarious intrigues that it would take another two hours to talk about. But what I wanted to show you in this video was basically a continuance from the Cold War to the 1990s expansion of NATO to the 2000s, where the CIA basically has a vested interest, which is basically the U.S., in keeping Europe NATO-oriented, which is a direct threat to Russia because they fear Russia will be, again, a threat to the supremacy of the United States to the world. Well, currently, as we speak, uh, Vladimir Putin ordered... Uh, its nuclear determined forces to be on high alert. Now, one thing about Putin is that he is a shrewd murderer, but he's intelligent, unlike our elected officials in government, such as Trump, Biden, Bush Jr., Obama, reading from a teleprompter, 
And this actually was a warning that I'm not the, I'm not Afghanistan. I'm not Iraq. I'm not Yemen. I'm not Syria. I'm not Libya. I'm a nuclear powerhouse where I can end the world with one button. And of course, the establishment left are basically saying, you see, Putin's a madman. But yet, their crocodile tears for Ukraine is met with irony because it is the United States who basically augmented a program during the Cold War and currently using the CIA to train paramilitaries to conduct guerrilla warfare in the disputed territories and to hold off Russia expanding west of the Ukraine. Which I would say, if that were to happen, that would be suicide on Russia's part. I don't think they're basically going to take Ukraine. Will they do a repeat of Afghanistan in 1980? Where they took over the capital of Kabul and it was slow to exit and the CIA augmented a program called Operation Cyclone? And who did they use? The ultra-Orthodox groups called the Mujahideen, supported by the Saudis and Pakistanis in which we saw the fall of the Soviet empire in 1991. And also currently, uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky agreed to meet with Russians on the border of Belarus without any preconditions, where he later said in a video address that he didn't expect the talks to be fruitful. So what's going on? What's the U.S. response as well to Russia and the media? Well, the United Nations basically suspended Russia Today and Press TV, I think, from broadcasting inside the United States. Just like that. In the private sector, FedEx and UPS announced they were suspending shipments to Russia, furthering Russia's economy with isolation. And on top of this, Biden's additional economic sanctions, which he claimed will hurt the oligarchs, which we know is not true, it basically hurts the common people. We saw this in the oil for food program in Afghanistan. The first Gulf War in Iraq in 1990, where over 500,000 sick men, elderly, and children died, starved to death, in which everyone here has seen the the uh, the meme or the video, the short video, in which uh, 60 Minutes interviews Madeleine Albright, the Secretary of State, saying, was the price worth it? regarding the oil for food program, 500,000 people. And in which Albright basically said, it's a hard question, but I ultimately the price was worth it. If past history isn't anything more than an indictment of the atrocities, the war crimes, the crimes of aggression, of the United States, then nothing is. And yes, you could be disparaged, you could be angry at seeing the left on viral media like Twitter or Facebook or TikTok or whatever they use these days. And their adamant defense for Ukraine. Don't make the mistake of siding with the right, which is what I'm trying to say here. Because even though pundits from Fox like Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity and um, a woman's name, a blonde hair, I forget her name. Uh, anyway, they talk about no war with Ukraine, but they do promote a war with China. So this is this what I'm trying to say to you is. Don't be fooled with the political divide because they're both guilty. They have blood in their hands because they're promoting warfare. 
They're promoting crimes of aggression, crimes against humanity. But as long as the United States is not part of the Rome statutes, where they could be held accountable for their war crimes. By the way, China, Israel, North Korea, Iraq, they're not part of the Rome statutes either, which is the reason why the United States can conduct these operations, these illegal operations, and conduct war crimes around the world because they're not going to be prosecuted. They got NATO on their side. And the coalition partners. So if anybody has questions, I'm, I'm willing to uh, entertain those. We do have 19 people here, which is remarkable. It's a lot of people for me. I'm glad you came. Hopefully you learned something as I'm learning uh, regarding this conflict in quick time. Because like most Americans, what did we know about Ukraine before the week was out? <laughs> I, I didn't know anything, really, to tell you the truth. So... Um, I see Reed Coverdale, National, uh, Naturalist Capitalist, was here. Uh, going to be speaking with him uh, Tuesday. Look forward to that. Laura Ingram. Thank you, Ingram. Laura Ingram. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's, it's, it's a precarious uh, situation that we're in. Uh, and it's unfortunate that we can't rely on a media to tell the truth about what's going on, even for something as pertinent to human life as this, because of the serious situation between two of the biggest nuclear powers on Earth, us and Russia. So I can end it here. We're at an hour. And... Um, I want to thank you very much for coming. Thank you for attending this uh, live video uh, about the CIA's influence in the region, which is basically an extension of the United States and their continued uh, or, or revitalization of a new Cold War because the old enemy, which is Islamic fundamentalism, is no longer a useful enemy for the continued global war on terror. They now have to revisit an enemy that once existed, which gave rise to the global war on terror, which is the Cold War. So thank you all for coming. Have a good evening. And I will uh, speak with you soon. I'm going to be doing a live video, maybe. Wednesday, Thursday, regarding United Airlines Flight 77. I've done live video discussions about uh, American Airlines Flight 11 and American Airlines Flight 175. Uh, so Wednesday or Thursday, I will do 77. So have a good night, everybody. Peace be on to you.